Thank you for joining us today. Over the course of the next half hour, Health Explorer is going to provide you with detailed educational content related to the often difficult to diagnose gastrointestinal condition known as Crohn's disease. Whether you personally are suffering from this condition or someone close to you is, we hope the information we provide not only answers your most critical questions, but also provides you with valuable insight when considering future treatment options. Crohn's disease is a chronic or ongoing disorder that causes inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. While it primarily causes ulcerations in the small and large intestines, it can affect any part of the digestive system from the mouth to the anus. The fact that Crohn's disease can affect any part of the digestive tract is what differentiates it from another inflammatory bowel condition called ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis affects the colon, which is the large intestine. Any portion of the large intestine can be involved. About a third of the patients have just the lower third, what's known as the rectum, involved. Another third of the patients will have the rectum and left side of the colon. And finally, about one third of patients, the entire colon is involved. It's particularly important to make the right diagnosis between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in patients that have only colonic inflammation. And the reason it's important is that once we've tried all of the medicines that we have available to us, if, the, if you're not responding or if the person isn't responding to these medicines, the next option is to have surgery. Crohn's yes, is classified as an autoimmune disorder, meaning that the body's own immune system is what causes the damage. In a normal, healthy person, the immune system protects the body from harmful elements like bacteria, viruses, and fungi. When the immune system activates its immune cells and proteins to do battle, it causes inflammation at the site. In Crohn's disease, there is a loss of regulation of the immune system within the intestinal tract, and it cycles between periods of great activity, ulceration, and periods of relative calm or remission. There are different types of Crohn's disease, and the different types may present with different findings and different complications. One type of Crohn's disease is inflammatory in nature, and it results in um, small erosions and breakdown of the lining of the bowel wall. Another type of Crohn's disease is what we call fibrostenotic, which tends to be more scar tissue forming. So the inflammation is healed by the body, but the resulting scar tissue can cause obstructive type of symptoms where the bowel is not moving properly. And the third type of Crohn's disease is what we call penetrating, and that means that the inflammation goes right through the wall of the bowel and has a tendency to form connections between loops of bowel or connections between the bowel and other organs or the skin. So the different types of Crohn's disease present in slightly different ways. It's important to diagnose Crohn's disease early because Crohn's disease is a progressive disease. And in some people, the Crohn's disease can progress very rapidly to complications such as narrowing of the small intestine leading to blockages or perforation of the small intestine requiring surgery. And we reason that by diagnosing it early, we can try to intervene in those people that are destined to have a poor outcome. It is estimated that nearly half a million Americans suffer from Crohn's disease. The condition affects both men and women equally, and onset usually occurs between the ages of 15 and 35. Crohn's disease historically was first noted to be prevalent in the Ashkenazi or European Jewish population, more prevalent than other Caucasian populations in Europe. But what we've seen is that the worldwide distribution of Crohn's disease really affects all races and ethnicities. And it appears to be a disease more of first world nations, probably related to hygiene more than genetics alone. Crohn's disease is a lifelong condition. We understand it to be a disease in which once someone is diagnosed, they're going to have one of several different patterns of disease. Fortunately, most people have a milder form of disease in which they have active symptoms that may limit their ability to work or go to school, but only uh, intermittently and rarely. Uh, some patients have more aggressive disease where the disease results in earlier surgery and they may end up with more disability from their condition and those patients need more aggressive therapy as well. And then some patients will cycle between the two conditions 
and uh, with the right therapy, and in many cases surgery, they'll end up with a milder um, form of the disease that's stable over time. The early symptoms for Crohn's disease may not prevent a person from going about their daily life. At first, it may seem like more of a hindrance than early onset of an actual disease. Some of the early symptoms of Crohn's disease is people having diarrhea or loose stool more frequently than they're used to having. Other things that people might experience are fatigue, low-grade fevers, night sweats, canker sores in their mouth, crampy abdominal pain after they eat. As the Crohn's disease progresses, especially when it's Crohn's disease of the small intestine, the small intestinal diameter can get smaller and smaller. And as you might imagine, food can start getting caught in the intestine. And so sometimes people, in a way, interestingly, subliminally, don't recognize the fact that they're eating less and less or, they're, or that they're avoiding high fiber foods in order to allow that food to go through without having pain. So people can get quite used to having to really dramatically modify their diet. And the extreme of that is that people start losing weight as a result of modifying their diet. When I was 19 years old, I came down with some symptoms that included diarrhea and heavy abdominal cramping that I tried to self-diagnose and self-medicate through homeopathic remedies. Um, after about six months of unsuccessfully doing that, I had lost about 50 pounds, went down to 115, and for a guy six feet one, that's pretty severe weight loss. And then I went to my primary care doctor who determined I had some form of inflammatory bowel disease. He scheduled me for a sigmoidoscopy, and during that they took some biopsies and were able to determine that I had Crohn's disease. Symptoms and complications of Crohn's disease will vary based on the area of the intestinal tract that is inflamed. That is why it is so important your doctor conduct the proper tests for an accurate diagnosis. There are several different procedures a physician may employ. Often, it will take a combination of tests to reach the best diagnosis of your condition. Blood work. This is when a blood sample is taken and tested for things like white and red blood cell count, sedimentation rates, low blood protein, and low blood mineral. Barium X-ray. Barium is a chalky substance that allows your organs to be seen clearly on an x-ray. It is either ingested orally so a physician can view your stomach and small intestine, or it is given via an enema so your physician can view your colon and terminal ileum. Barium allows the physician to see ulcerations, narrowing, and sometimes even fistula, which is an abnormal connection of the bowel to another organ. Colonoscopy a colonoscopy is a procedure where a doctor uses a small, flexible viewing tube to directly analyze the rectum and the large intestine. A colonoscopy is more accurate than a barium x-ray in detecting small ulcers or areas of inflammation within the colon or terminal ileum. Biopsy. During a colonoscopy, your doctor may take a small tissue sample of the inflamed area for lab analysis. Computer-Aided Tomography Scan Also known as a CAT scan, this procedure utilizes computer imaging and X-ray scanning to produce a detailed image of the entire abdomen and pelvis. It is also very helpful in detecting abscesses, which are collections of pus that occur in the tissue, a cavity, or other confined area. CT Enterography is a new variation of the CT scan that produces images of the intestines similar to barium x-rays. Video Capsule Endoscopy This modern electronic technique utilizes a capsule that contains a miniature camera. As the camera capsule travels through the small intestine, the video signal is transmitted back to the receiver. Your doctor is then able to analyze the images on a computer monitor. Once your physician has diagnosed what area of your gastrointestinal tract has been affected and to what extent, he may refer to the condition using different names specific to the location of the inflammation. Crohn's colitis. This is an inflammation that is exclusive to the colon. Common symptoms are abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. But a person might also experience anal fistula or pararectal abscesses. 
Crohn's enteritis. This is an inflammation that is confined to the small intestine. The small intestine is made of two parts. The first part is the jejunum, and the second part is called the ileum. If the ileum alone is affected, your condition would be called Crohn's ileitis. Common symptoms are also abdominal pain and diarrhea, but obstruction of the small intestine can also occur. Crohn's terminal ileitis. This is an inflammation that affects only the very end of the small intestine, closest to the colon. As with Crohn's enteritis, common symptoms are abdominal pain and diarrhea, but obstruction of the small intestine can also occur. Crohn's enterocolitis and ileocolitis are terms used to describe when inflammation affects both the small intestine and the colon. Again, abdominal pain and diarrhea are common symptoms and obstruction of the small intestine may occur. Okay. Approximately 20% of people with Crohn's disease develop complications around their anus. We call it perianal disease, so just a fancy word to say around their anus. And those complications can include having a fissure uh, of the anal canal. So the anal canal is really the muscle that, that, that holds us from having stool all the time. And the, the sign of that is that you go to the bathroom and it's ex very painful to have a bowel movement and often has bleeding associated with it. So that's an anal fissure. People with Crohn's disease can also have something called anal tags. They're like big pieces of skin around the anus that you can feel when you're wiping and they can be painful. And finally, they can have something called fistulas. And a fistula is a fancy word for a connection between the inside of the bowel to the outside of the bowel. In this case, usually from the anus or the rectum, to the skin around the anus, so these are fistulas. Most people notice them because they're, they feel like painful bumps, like you're sitting on a big pimple, and can sometimes explode and drain pus and occasionally stool or blood that comes from these fistulas, but it can be very painful. Obviously, Crohn's disease is not a condition to be taken lightly. While it is rarely fatal, the condition can significantly affect quality of life for the individual. Currently, there's no cure for this condition. However, there are a number of treatments that are utilized to try and increase periods of remission so that the intestinal tissue may heal and so that patients may live their lives without disruption. Number five, aminosalicylic acid, which is similar to aspirin in chemical composition, has been effective in treating the symptoms associated with Crohn's disease if the drug is administered topically to the inflamed intestinal lining. 5-amino salicylic acid, which is also known as mesalamine, can be administered either orally as pill forms or topically, and by that we mean through the rectum, as either suppositories or enemas. There are several different oral formulations of 5-amino salicylic acid or 5-ASA. The simplest is pure 5-ASA or mesalamine that is coated in several ways to protect it against absorption high in the intestinal tract so that it can get down into the lower portions to have its best effectiveness. In those formulations of pure 5-ASA, they're generally very well tolerated with very few side effects aside from very rare allergies. Kidney function by a blood test needs to be monitored about once a year but this is very rare to have an effect on the kidneys. The other formulations require carrier compounds to get the 5-ASA down to lower portions in the intestine. And sometimes these carriers, particularly if it's a sulfa in a compound called sulfasalazine, can cause allergic reactions such as nausea, headache, skin rashes, or just feeling malaise or fatigue. One of the other primary methods for trying to reduce the inflammation associated with Crohn's disease is the use of systematic corticosteroids. Systematic corticosteroids have been used for many years to treat patients who have moderate to severe cases of Crohn's disease. Corticosteroids work by being absorbed into the bloodstream and then circulating throughout the body and heal the bowel from a circulation in the bloodstream. That's also why, however, they have significant side effects. So many patients are quite aware of the steroid side effects and therefore don't want to be on steroids. Steroids are used for people with more severe Crohn's disease in many cases or for a short period of time when they have a relapse or a flare of their disease. 
there's an additional specific steroid called budesonide that's been formulated to release in the last part of the small intestine that we think works more topically, but it still has some absorption. So the side effects from budesonide are substantially less than regular corticosteroids, but not as uh, low as the minimal to no side effects of the immunosalicylates. Recent studies have shown that corticosteroids probably cause people with Crohn's disease to have more perforating complications, which means more perforation of the small intestine, more abscesses, make the disease actually worse. And so we're trying to avoid corticosteroids. The other things that they can do are cause osteoporosis, uh, which is, of course, thinning of the bones, and cataracts or glaucoma, which can cause visual loss. If a person is specifically suffering from Crohn's colitis, antibiotics may be utilized for treatment. While the exact mechanism of action is not completely understood, they have shown positive results when treating the anal fistula that develop. We believe that Crohn's disease is driven by the presence of bacteria in the bowel and by reducing that bacteria we might control the inflammation. So in fact, even when people don't have infections, we use antibiotics to treat Crohn's disease of the large intestine, and we also use antibiotics to treat draining fistulas of the perianal area in some patients. A very interesting bit of scientific evidence has been developed that you can use antibiotics as well to prevent recurrence after surgery for Crohn's disease. So we know that Crohn's unfortunately comes back after surgery in many patients. Giving an antibiotic after that surgery can prevent or delay the recurrence. The problem, however, is that we don't seem to know how long we can keep that from happening, and using antibiotics long term is concerning for obvious reasons to many. While the various treatments we have discussed have a positive history of effectively helping suppress the body's inflammatory response, modern medicine is providing additional alternatives. In our next segment, we'll look at a category of drugs called biologic response modifiers that have shown great promise in helping patients manage Crohn's disease even more effectively.